Hello and welcome to lesson three of Discovering Jesus in the Old Testament. I am Pastor Eli Rojas Jr. And before we begin, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much that you have been with us and protecting us. And I pray that as we're opening your word and as we're going through this lesson tonight, that you will guide us and help us to, to learn and to grow. And more importantly, as we study, we always have these wonderful insights. We always learn wonderful things, but Lord, teach us to apply what we learn to, to not just know that you're Messiah, that, that Jesus is the Messiah, but to, to know how to put that into practice and how to use that information in our own lives so that we can glorify you more. Bless us in these things, I pray in Jesus name. Amen. So, a lot of people in in our history have claimed to be the messiah in fact today um we have several people of almost in every continent i'm not aware of anyone in antarctica who has claimed to be the messiah but we have people in south america we have people in asia and africa and in all over the world um who have claimed to be the messiah and who have said that they are the incarnations of jesus and and other things and the Bible helps us to, to know for sure um, whether the Messiah, whether this person is the Messiah or not. We don't have to guess. And, um, and we can put the word of God to, to, to test them to see if they really meet up with those, with those requirements or if, if, um, if maybe they, they've gotten down a wrong path or maybe they um, might need to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but um, but the Bible helps us to know who the Messiah is. We don't have to be guessing, or we don't have to go by who's the most charismatic or who's the person that preaches the best. We can go by who's the one that meets the specific requirements found in the Bible. So we look at um, we were looking at the lineage of Jesus. In Matthew and, and Luke, and we saw how how there's slight differences, and the explanation might be one that connects Jesus to the priesthood, and one that connects Jesus to the king, the kingship. The other possibility is that one is following his father's um, path, his the the lineage of Joseph. And the other is following the lineage of Mary. But either way, um, both of them are leading to Jesus and, and neither of them are, are incorrect in, the, in what they're saying. So um, the significant, significant omissions, there are four people that are taken out of the lineage. And those were people that were considered wicked. Um, they were evil um, kings and obviously there's no one perfect in the lineage but these people seem to have disqualified themselves from the lineage of jesus but also the possibility is that that um matthew was just really intent on on his poetic structure on on not just showing that jesus is the messiah but actually keeping it even at 14 generations so um it's a possibility, but it seems to be more focused on the evil of those kings, because if that was the case, he could have knocked off four other people, but um, he didn't include these people. And there seems to be that reason that he he was that those men were were unworthy of being included in the lineage of Jesus. But then there were very interesting inclusions. Um, why did he? include Tamar? Why did he uh, include Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba? And, and it's interesting. I mean, they seem to be um, from, from a Gentile background. It seems like um, there was other issues there. There was, um, it's, uh, there seems like, like a covenant situation as well. Why did they include uh, Tamar and not include Sarah? Why did they include Bathsheba and not include Leah? These are interesting questions. And, and I think that, um, that we'll have to find out 
in heaven sometimes. Uh, sometimes those are the only places that we can find true answers without speculation. Um, but it's interesting to see who was included in the, the lineage of Jesus. Well, last, last time we went over all these different prophecies that show who Jesus was going to be. Um, if, if he wasn't born in Bethlehem, then you can't be the Messiah. It's, it's unfortunate. So I was born in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. There is no way I could be the Messiah. Um, so, seed of David, seed of Abraham. So it, it, the first one's pretty easy, you know, just have to be a human being. Um, the second one, it's also pretty easy. I mean, Abraham had had many sons. Um, and then it starts to get progressively harder, but the seed of David, a little harder. Son of God, um, that's a little bit more specific. There's not many people who can actually claim to be the son of God in that literal sense. Um, born of a virgin, also difficult. Um, but we see here that Jesus meets with each one of these requirements very specifically. So now we're going to go into the ministry of Jesus and the prophecies that line up to his ministry. So the first one is in Malachi, um, right there, Malachi. Uh, I, I can't read the, the numbers because it's, it's uh, covered by the, the little line, but it says, uh, see, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. So we, we hear about this messenger that's going to precede the ministry of Jesus. And we know that that person uh, was John the Baptist. The next one uh, was this, and he will go before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready uh, people prepared for the Lord. That's what Luke 1, 17 says. And, um, and that who's, is, is who John the Baptist was. So what did the spirit of Elijah mean? Well, the spirit of Elijah, uh, we can take it from the ministry of Elijah. Um, Elijah preached repentance from idolatry, and we know that John the Baptist was preceding was preceding Jesus in the spirit of Elijah was the person who was called by God to prepare the way of the Lord, and we see that um, that John the Baptist was preaching repentance from legalism, and so we see a little bit of the both sides of the same coin, where both are preparing people for the coming of, of Jesus, coming of the Lord, but one is preaching the repentance from idolatry, which is one side of the road, is one ditch on one side, and the other one is preaching repentance from legalism, which is uh, the other side of the road. And so um, both are calling people's hearts and minds back to God, and both have a, a very specific ministry in um in in reaching people and repent in in calling for repentance so to me i see the spirit of elijah being that uh preaching of repentance that preaching of of coming back to of a holy understanding of 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 coming away from from our extremes that we get into and and following god avoiding avoiding the far extreme of idolatry of following after our own desires and and creating our own gods and also avoiding the the other extreme of legalism which is basically a self-righteousness of creating our own righteousness based on our own actions and turning into that grace and obedience um, common ground that middle ground of I I trust and obey but I also lean on God for my for my uh, for my righteousness. I'm not seeking my own righteousness. So that's what um, what John the Baptist did. He preached and prepared the way for Jesus, 
and allowed for Jesus to, for his ministry to work out of all the people that were listening to John the Baptist, many of them went on to become Jesus's disciples and, um, and even more people than we realize because um, we never really have a, a true understanding of how many people were following Jesus because it only tells us at the end that after he was, after he was uh, crucified and, and resurrected that there were so many people that were in the upper room together. But there was parts where he had thousands of, of disciples that were following him and learning from him. And um, there was a point where they couldn't follow him anymore. He, he gave them something that was too heavy for them and they ended up uh, breaking away and, and leaving Jesus. But many of the disciples, and, and even more than we realized, that followed John ended up following Jesus uh, until, until that moment, until that, all right, you can, either, you can either keep going or you can turn back, and many of them turned back. So another part that is focused is, um, is clear about who the Messiah was going to be is that he, the Messiah, was going to have a ministry of service. A lot of people in the in the Old Te in the New Testament time were looking for this king who is going to conquer, and they missed this verse in Isaiah sixty one verse one um, that this Messiah was going to be a servant. He was going to be um, helping the people he was going to be preaching and teaching so it says the spirit of the lord is upon me because the lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound so um, that was jesus mission was to to serve and to help the people who were suffering who was who were um, heartbroken and, and slaves to sin and, and prisoners of their own sinfulness. And, and Jesus came to, to, to preach the good tidings, to do all those things. He came to serve us as, a, as the Messiah. He didn't come to, to be served, but to serve. So his ministry was focused in Galilee, which is a very beautiful area. And that was also prophesied. Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2 says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. So right there we see he was going to be in Galilee. I'm unfortunately disqualified because my ministry is here in Elizabeth City in the outer in the in the far far eastern division as they would call it. So um unless unless their ministry is in Galilee they can't be uh the Messiah. So and we see that Jesus spent a lot of his time a majority of his ministry in the area of Galilee. His ministry was going to be to Gentiles as well. Isaiah 49, 6 says, It is too light a thing that the that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So everyone who understood the Messiah in the New Testament were looking for the Messiah to rescue Israel, to preserve Israel when Isaiah made it clear that the Messiah was going to bring salvation to the all the ends of the earth. So his his focus was going to be much greater than than Israel. His tenderness is is something very special. Isaiah 40:11, he will carry the lambs in his arms holding them close to his heart. And we see that in his ministry, his tenderness, his his compassion how he treated people, especially in that time, the people who were unlovable. We see how he treated the Samaritan woman. We see how he treated 
the children, how he treated people who were um, crippled and who were ostracized in society. People who were in disease in that time were said to be cursed by God. And instead of running away from them, he was seeking them. He was hugging them and he was healing them physically, not just not just with words, but actually embracing them and, and touching them. And, and it's interesting when you look at the prophecies in, um, I mean, the uh, miracles in the New Testament, in the, in the Gospels, and you look at how he does different things for different people. Um, Jesus could have healed everyone the same way, but you see how sometimes um, he will heal someone in a very specific way. What comes to mind is the leper who has this terrible skin disease all over his body. This is a disease that was so bad that your, your body would basically, um, pieces of your body would die because of, of blood flow and, and, um, and things like that. And so the extremities would start dying and, and falling off. So you had fingers and noses and ears that would fall off and there was, it was highly contagious to the point that you could get it from touching another person. And the way he heals this person after so many years of leprosy is he touches them to heal them. And how, how important, how special that is that he, he never treated everyone the, uh, the same. He treated them the way that they needed to be treated in order to understand his love and his compassion. So we see that that's a very distinct sign of who the Messiah was going to be. And that's who Jesus was. So um, also the zeal for righteousness, Psalm 69, 9 says, for, the, for zeal for your house has consumed me and the reproach of those who reproach have, you have fallen on me. And so we see that happens to be fulfilled in Jesus when he um, has that zeal for the temple of God and he chases out the money, the money changers, and he uh, turns over the tables and you see that passion for, for holiness coming into, uh, showing, demonstrated in Jesus's life as well. Um, use of parables. Uh, I bet, I bet you didn't know that that was actually going to be a distinctive part of who the Messiah was going to be. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. And Jesus used so many parables. And it's a very good teaching method. Uh, a lot of times the parables that he was using were common, but were twisted. So, um, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus is, is one that was commonly used, but where the rich man went to heaven and the poor man uh, would go to hell. And in the parable, Jesus twists it and he makes the poor man go to heaven, Lazarus go to heaven, and the rich man go to hell. And there was a lot of stories like that where... Um, Jesus would tell a story that many people had heard in the past, but he would twist it to emphasize his point and to show how, how um, you know, these clever, nice sayings that we were used, that, that people use, and we still do, we're still guilty of this. We have these nice stories and nice sayings that we like to apply universally, but how many times, um, because it sounds nice, it, it kind of sticks more in our hearts and minds when it actually takes us away from what God is trying to lead us to. So um, the fact that Jesus used a lot of parables is part of uh, his ministry. That's the Messiah was going to be speaking in parables. His healing ministry was going to be um, very important. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb sing Isaiah 35 5 and 6 so we know that Jesus healed and he healed everywhere he went and he performed many miracles more miracles than we could fit into all the books in in the world so um John Matthew Mark Luke and John are basically the highlights of Jesus' ministry 
if they were to put all of his ministry, there wouldn't be enough books written. Um, there's not enough paper to write all the books that we would need to in order to to write all the miracles that Jesus did. But this is, it just shows us a glimpse into what Jesus would do. And he healed many, many people. That's part of his ministry. Triumphant entry. So in, um, in the week before Jesus is going to be crucified, he actually um, calls his disciples over and tells him to get a donkey and, and lead him into Jerusalem. And as he's coming into Jerusalem on a donkey, um, they throw down their coats and they throw down palm branches and, and they declare him as, as the king. And, and they, they almost give him a crown right then and there. Um, but that was actually part of the messianic prophecy. He was, he was fulfilling prophecy says in Zechariah 9, 9, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And Jesus very specifically um, rode on the foal of a donkey. And, um, and ironically, the same people who were shouting, praise Jesus and and uh, we're ready to crown him we're actually the same people that later on would would cry crucify him so unfortunately um, we can be fickle sometimes uh, but the 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 prophecy was was fulfilled and Jesus rode on a donkey and entered Jerusalem as a king his ministry um, would begin at a very specific time. We, it kind of goes over our head how how specific and how wonderful prophecy can be sometimes. Um, the seventy week prophecy is very very specific, and and just to I, I know that this is not enough time for us to to go into this, but we're just going to do a, a quick overview. Uh, follow through, but um, just a quick principle. So um, I believe that time prophecies can all be understood in a similar way in the sense that um, in many places, the Bible says that you can take a day of Bible prophecy and translate it into a year of literal time. So 70 weeks, seven times 70 uh, would be 490. That would be um, 490 years. And it says, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make an atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy place. So, so you are to know and discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. You'll be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of, of distress. So we have a little bit of my, how would I say, uh, <laughs> quick synopsis of what that means. So you have the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, which took 457 BC. And we have the principle of one year for a day. So seven, 490 years would have taken from 457 to 33 AD. That was going to be um, the, the time when the Messiah would be crucified not not i mean uh, with the the time for for the i'm sorry i should have said this again so that 490 years was for the the nation of israel specifically after that time the um the gospel was going to go out into all the world so it said seven weeks to 
the rebuilding of Jerusalem. So after the command of the king, you had 49 years between, before the, the streets are, and everything is built and perfectly as new. Then you have the 62 weeks, which leads to not when Jesus was born, but when Jesus started his ministry. So you have the last week, he shall confirm the covenant. So you have that last seven days of the week or seven years in the middle of the week, um, he, he would confirm the covenant. So in the middle, after three and a half years of ministry, that's exactly when Jesus was crucified. He was uh, baptized in, at that point in, in three and a half years earlier. His ministry lasts three and a half years. He's crucified. And then three and a half years after his crucifixion is when the stoning of Stephen occurs. And that's actually when the, the disciples of Jesus are forced to leave Jerusalem. And that's what starts this great movement that actually goes all over the world of sharing the good news of Jesus with everyone. It doesn't mean that uh, from that point on, um, God abandoned the Jewish people. It just means that now the gospel is for everyone. And um, instead of relying on the Jewish people to share the gospel with the world, now the gospel is going to be going beyond the Jewish people to everyone in the entire world. So um, that prophecy was very specific. It told us when he was going to be baptized, when he was his ministry was going to start, and it told us when he would be crucified. And to the year, to the half of a year, because Jesus was crucified at three and a half years exactly from the time his ministry started. That is too specific to be a coincidence. And um it's too specific for anyone else to be able to fulfill it. There is no way because it's too late now. At this point, if the Messiah wasn't, didn't start his ministry in, in, um, in AD 30, then um, I'm not, I'm sorry, AD 27, then, then there's no way that they, that anyone could be the Messiah. Because this right here tells us exactly when this time period was going to start. All we had to do is look up history. We just look up a book, look up when the command to rebuild Jerusalem was going to be. It starts here. It goes 69 weeks all the way to um, 483 up to, to 30 AD. Three and a half years later, we have the crucifixion. And three and a half years later, we have the Sony of Stephen. It adds up perfectly. The math is undeniable. And no one else could, unless they fit this exact time period, could claim to be the Messiah. And unfortunately, um, the Bible was very clear that as much as Jesus would, would um, serve and create miracles and do all that he did, um, his ministry was not only to heal it was to, to to shed his blood for us um so we see here it was he was uh, meant to um, bear reproach psalm 69 20 says reproach has broken my heart and i am full of heaviness and i looked for someone to take pity but there was none and for comforters he was also rejected and his suffering was prophesied in Isaiah 53, verse 3. It says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. It's sad, but um, Isaiah told us very clearly that as much as Jesus is going to be a king of kings and as much as he's going to be lord of lords and he's going to be in charge and and all those things that we're looking forward to in the future his ministry on earth was going to be heartbreaking it was going to be suffering 
and and Jesus was rejected more than anyone else. You know, it's hard for us. Imagine dating and and job applications. You put in too many job applications, and you get too much rejection, and you start to uh, feel a big burden and feel heartbroken. And after a while, you stop you stop trying. But Jesus was rejected more than anyone else on this earth, and he was familiar with pain, was familiar with suffering, and yet he gladly took this ministry and kept going. He knew he was gonna, what he was going to deal with before he was born, but um, in spite of that, he chose to suffer um, for, for our love, for our salvation. He was hated by many. Psalm 69, 4 says, They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. He was also, again, uh, he was going to be the, the stone that the builders rejected. Um, we have here, we have the the second part of the prophecy which we know is true but the first part is the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone the the jesus was going to be re rejected by the by the main leaders by the builders of religion in their society and even though he was going to be rejected by them um uh, the, the rest of the rest of those who accepted jesus ministry will build their foundation upon him. Um, nations and people would turn on Jesus. Psalms 2, verses 1 through 3. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst the bonds apart and cast away the cords from us. And we see that multiple nations were involved in the rejection of Jesus and the crucifixion of Jesus. Betrayed by a friend, Psalms 41.9, Yes, my own familiar friend in which I trusted, which did eat of my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And um, we see that that happened. We can say that happened with, with Judas, but it also happened with every single one of his disciples. His followers would be scattered, says Zechariah 13, 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, said the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. Yeah, unfortunately, the as soon as Jesus was arrested, those disciples went running in all different directions. One of them was so scared that he ended up running naked. And um, his cloak was taken from him and he ran away naked because he was so scared about what was going on. And we see that when Jesus suffered, he had to suffer alone for that reason. Zechariah 11, 12 through 13 is very specific again. It says, and I said unto them, if you think good, give me my price and if not forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver, and the Lord said unto me, Cast it into the potter, a godly, goodly price that I was valued by them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. So we see here exactly what was going to take place. Uh, Judas sells, um, sells Jesus to the Sanhedrin for 30 pieces of silver, and yet he tries to throw back the um, silver to the priest, and it ends up being um, used to buy the potter's field where uh, Judas hangs himself. So we see here to the very amount that Judas sells Jesus and to everything that happens afterward, um, God knew it and he prophesied it so that we would know for sure that Jesus is the Messiah. Suffering at Calvary, Psalms twenty two fourteen says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. And um, Psalms 22, if you take the time to read it, actually goes very deep into um, the suffering of Jesus. And we know that it wasn't David. He was 
um, writing prophetically because it describes the crucifixion perfectly. It talks about um, his bones are out of joint. They they even um, talks about casting lots for clothes and the dogs and and all the things that happen. Um, it's very specific and it clearly describes the sacrifice of Jesus. They he was also is very clear that before Jesus suffered that he was going to bear the sins of many. Isaiah 53, 12, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So for, for people to confuse the role of Messiah, uh, they're missing a lot of verses in the Old Testament, because it's very clear that Jesus was going to suffer he was going to die and he was going to bear the sins of many uh, also uh, uh, isaiah 53 7 describes jesus's character perfectly and the lamb of god is not a coincidence that jesus is described as the lamb of god it says that he would be silent as a lamb it said he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears. And so he did not open his mouth. And the people, how they treated him, we know that uh, Jesus, as he was being crucified, they spit in his face and they called him all kinds of names and he was beaten. And that's that was clear that that's what was going to take place. Isaiah 56 said, 50 verse 6, I gave my back to those who strike. What happened? He was he was um, uh, whipped in his back with with um, uh, a whip, a, a very special whip called a cat of nine tails. And, um, and my cheeks to those who pull out my beard. And he did have his beard ripped off his face. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. And he was spit on and he was treated horribly. He hit, punched, all kinds of things, bruised and afflicted. And um, it really is hard for us to imagine, but um, we focus a lot on the physical pain of Jesus. And and it really wasn't the, the most important aspect of his sacrifice. The crucifixion, um, when you think about it, it was painful, it was bloody, it was horrible. Um, but it was far worse to bear the sins of, of the world. Uh, that was a far greater pain than anything he felt physically. But it is incredible to imagine how much Jesus went through on the day of crucifixion. But God blesses us. He, there's also the next part of, of Jesus' uh, messianic role is the victory aspect of it. So there would be victory. Psalms 20 verses 6 and 7 says, Know this, now this I know, the Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious, victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in, in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. So um, we see that as much as Jesus would suffer, there would be victory. Some... Uh, the sun would quell rebellion, uh, Psalms 2, 10 through 12. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoicing with trembling. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Be blessed are all who take refuge in him. So there would be, um, there will be a... Uh, a, a quelling of that rebellion. And there's also going to be a new covenant, Jeremiah 31, verses 33. But this is the new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So that is the new covenant that Jesus makes with us after his sacrifice. 
and um and jesus was gonna take is now he's taking his rightful place at the right hand of god psalms 16 8 through 11 says i have set the lord always before me because he is my right hand i shall not be shaken therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices my flesh also dwells secure for you will not abandon me abandon my soul to sheol or let excuse me uh let the whole let your holy one see corruption for you make it known to me the path of life in your presence there is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forever so and we will we'll see another verse that talks about that more specifically too he will make many righteous uh, isaiah 53 10 through 12 says still it was it would in what god had in mind all along to crush him with pain the plan was that he gave himself as an offering for sin so that he'd see life come from it life life and more life and god's plan will deeply prosper through him out of that terrible travail of soul he he he'll see that it's worth it and he'd be glad he did it through what he experienced my righteous one my servant will make many righteous ones as he himself carries the burden of their sins and he will be our high priest psalms 110 verses 1 through 4 the lord said unto my lord sit at my right hand like we were talking about uh, in the last the slide before last until i make your enemies your footstool the lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of zion rule thou in the midst of thine enemies thy people will be in will be willing in the day of, of your power in the be beauties and holiness from the womb of the morning thou you have the dew of thy youth the lord has sworn and will not repent you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And Jesus has become our high priest. And that's why we, we don't need priests anymore because everyone who was a priest before Jesus was pointing to Jesus. And now that Jesus has accomplished his sacrifice for us, he has become our high priest and, and we don't need to rely on human high priests anymore. Now we have a better high priest. So going down to the line, it, it's we didn't mention all 55 um, prophecies. There's, there's a few more. We mentioned a lot of them, and we can see how specific they are. So the point where, it, you know, if I, was, if I was lying about something, then all I would have to do is be very vague. If I said, okay, you know, I'm a prophet and I want you to believe me, so I'm going to tell you something that is pretty big. I, I can say, it's going to rain in the next few days. Well, how easy is it for that to happen? I mean, even if, you, if it didn't rain here, I could say, well, you know, I was a little off. It rained. It actually rained up north a little bit. It actually rained uh, down south a little bit. But I, I was pretty close. But for the prophecies to be so specific... Um, there's really very little chance that anybody could fulfill that prophecy. And there's a myth that comes out of um, out of this this thought because a lot of people's like, well, you know, what are the chances that we got it wrong? What are the chances that Jesus isn't the Messiah? And and the mathematician kind of came up with this number. So he said, okay, if there was one detail, and you would have one chance in two of fulfilling it. It's either yes or no. If there are 10 details, if there's 10 prophecies, then you have one chance in about 1,024. That's hard, but that's still better than the lottery. Let's just say that. If you had 20 details, 20 prophecies that are specific, you have one chance in a million, over a million. With 25, you have one chance in 33 million. But I don't know how to say the number. <laughs> you, uh, let's just say uh, if there are 55 prophecies, you have one chance in 36 
128, 797, 018, 963, 968. So that, all right, let's say you got thousand, million, billion, trillion, uh, quadrillion. There's one chance in 36 quadrillion that, um, that that person would be, would fulfill that prophecy. And especially when we look at the time and the, the specifics, uh, there's even less chance than that, um, that the, anybody would be the Messiah. So it couldn't have been anyone in, in the time of Jesus. There was no one else that fulfilled that prophecy. No one else in history has been able to meet up those 55 prophecies about the Messiah perfectly. And, um, and, and, we have to know that that there's nothing in the future. Jesus is 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 not something that that um, he's going to surprise us with. the The truth is that Jesus has a second coming, and he's going to come back, but it's not going to be the same way. We have to be ready at any moment. So Matthew twenty four forty four says, "So you must also be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour." When you do not expect him but the verse thessalonians 4 16 and 17 tells us how jesus is going to come back and it tells us that it's is not going to be um by just appearing by just popping up it says for the lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of god and the dead in christ will rise first then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, never does he actually come and touch the ground. And so we shall be always with the Lord. So Jesus is gonna come back to bring us to heaven and he's gonna come back in glory. He's gonna come back with angels and with trumpet and he's gonna wake the dead and he's gonna bring everyone to him. And guess what? He's never gonna touch the ground. He says that everyone who is alive and who is resurrected are going to meet him, are going to go up to heaven. So anyone who says that they're Jesus hasn't read the Bible clearly because uh, if Jesus is not going to touch the earth, he's not going to, to be here. He's going to call us up to him. So there's no way that any of these guys, uh, as charismatic as they may be, as, you know, outgoing and friendly and you know maybe they maybe they kiss babies you know could it is it possible that they even perform miracles but unless they fulfill the 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 letter of the bible they cannot be the messiah they cannot be jesus and and even if they say well you know it's just jesus he felt like he needed to come back to earth and re-educate us. And so I am the reincarnation of Jesus. The Bible is very clear that if anyone claims to be Jesus, if anyone claims to be the Messiah, don't believe him. Don't believe them. Because Jesus is going to come back the second time. He's going to come back with angels and he's going to come back and raise the dead and bring us all to heaven is not going to be um he's not going to be in russia somewhere uh preaching the gospel he's not going to be in south africa he's not going to be in all these places where we have these messiahs these quote unquote messiahs so anyone who at this point is claiming to be the messiah is practically admitting to us that they are a false messiah because no one could be a messiah except for Jesus, and Jesus is not going to come back in a physical form until he's ready to take us all to heaven. So as much as we can question, say, oh man, that guy actually performs miracles. Well, uh, you can't claim to be Jesus and perform miracles and, and be um, part of the, of the Bible truth because anyone who is claiming to be the messiah is a liar and anyone who's a liar is not is not being used by god 
So they might be doing good things, but unless unless they're not lying about it, unless they're being honest or being truthful, then that's not they're deceiving in order to do other things, in order to to sub, subdue the minds and the hearts of people. But uh, we have to be clear. We have to be clear, and we have to be uh, stand on the word of God. God says that we can. T- we have to test and and make sure that uh, we don't fall for the most charismatic person, that we don't fall for the person that, you know, even if they, the, the Bible says, even if they perform miracles, if they, if they are like angels, and if an angel comes with a different gospel, reject them, because no matter what, if, if it doesn't fit what the Bible has taught us, if it doesn't fit the word of God, then it is a deception that Satan is trying to use to win people's hearts and minds. And we have to be um, we have to be smarter than our feelings because I can be I can be swayed by charisma. I can be swayed by miracles happening, but um, if I am grounded in the Word of God, even when my heart is telling me, "Yes, oh man, I completely that person is all oh, right. I gotta follow," and then but my mind my knowledge is going to check my heart and say, you know, Eli, that's a charismatic person, but it can't be the Messiah because the Bible has told us what the truth is concerning the Messiah. Well, I hope that um, you've been blessed tonight. Next week, we're going to start our lesson, The Blood of the Lamb, which is talking about the sacrificial system and how it points to Jesus. So join me next week. We're going to start on lesson four, the blood of the Lamb. Let's close with prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this time. I pray that you will use this um, this lesson to reach people's hearts and minds, that we can stand on your word and that we can have boldness of faith that we know that only Jesus could have been the Messiah. And, and no other can fit, can claim, make that claim, Lord, that we can have full faith in Jesus, that he is the Messiah, and that the next part of his messianic ministry is going to happen very soon. He's already given his life for us. He's already saved us. The only thing that is left is for him to bring us to heaven, to rescue us from this sin and and and. and destructive world. So Lord, help us to be ready that we can rejoice in the victory of the Messiah. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor.